Yeah. And we've already had a, uh, a touch of a sense of humor. I think so, uh, yeah. Sure. So I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Rebecca. When we started the uh, Great Decisions, we started it in 2022. I talked to Rebecca about complementing our seminars with speakers. And I'm beginning to wonder if Rebecca has a background or is destined for Hollywood working for the Mars <laughs> Agency or something. She brings in first class and world class speakers. And so as you know, we've gone through all these <clears throat> topics here for the great decisions from energy geopolitics to war crimes into China's foreign policy and today into economic warfare and working off of what uh, Rebecca has said with our distinguished speaker series many of you know we've had Amy Knight considered a foremost expert on the KGB and uh, Russia and Putin here in the west in fact she lives in Southern we had uh, from this book here the great decisions handbook the author of the first one, Carolyn Kassan, is actually here to speak as well on geopolitical energy out of NYU. And we've had uh, the provost of Fairleigh Dickinson here, yep. um, Peter, uh, Peter Woolley, Woolley, who spoke on the midterm elections. Peter was here. Uh, we've had Maggie Lewis uh, talking about China out of uh, Seton Hall. Hall. You have Daniel Maxwell, who again is one of the authors here, coming to talk about what is it? The global famine. Global famine. And then uh, in addition, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, I guess, it's Dan Maxwell who's out of Tufts, right? That'll be we talking via Zoom. Yeah. Um, the format we're taking today, and we're most fortunate to have uh, Mark here, is a two for one. And as I went through the, his resume here and looked at his expansive background, I thought best to have Mark talk to us and then open it up just not on economic, economic warfare but really a wide range of topics that he's conversing with. So you go through the background, he pioneered college ed education reforms in China. Um, he's uh, been teaching economics, helping hundreds of students get onto top graduate programs. Program coordinator for the Open Society Institute. Um, along with this, uh, when I was sharing this with one of uh, my good friends here and mentioned uh, your contributions in nonlinear econometric modeling of bank regulations, that's when he really lit up. Uh, and as a liberal arts major, I'm still trying to process that particular one. <laughs> uh, let me just give you here a smattering of Dr. Weinstock's uh, courses, because as we talk here with Mark, the idea is we'll talk economic warfare, we'll get his educated point of view. And then other topics that he talks to are fair game for questions. Sports economics, money and banking, quantitative analysis and forecasting, Sports and entertainment economics, eco crime, economic crime, war terrorism for today, uh, central banking, China's financial system, from Wall Street to the Great Wall, applied uh, great game theory, faces of the Fed, South American philosophy. It doesn't end. With that, Mark, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. I'll try and I won't be able to live up to that, but I'll just do what I can do. I'm glad to see you all today amidst the uh, rain. I know it's hard to get out and drive and get around, but it's great that you came out. I thought there would be two people here and we just have coffee and then I'd leave. But I'm glad that so many of you are here and you have such a great turnout. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, Mark Weinstock. I'm a clinical associate professor of economics at Pace University. I'm mainly stationed downtown across from City Hall, but uh, I do teach at Pleasantville in the Pleasantville campus as well. Uh, what do I usually teach? Uh, I usually teach introductory courses every semester. You know, those huge lecture hall classes with 150 students in them. And that's in micro and macro, but mainly macroeconomics, which is, of course, the whole economy and government policy that affects unemployment and inflation and economic growth. And then I teach several specialty areas. I uh, teach sports and entertainment economics on a regular basis. I teach game theory every semester. Uh, game theory is relatively, relatively new branch of economics. You may have seen the movie A Beautiful Mind or read the book by Sylvia Nasser. And uh, that's about John Nash and the, and, and the economics of strategy and, and how, to do, how to analyze different strategies and uh, situations to try and predict what their outcome might be and also to recommend how to play the game if you're one of the participants. So I do a lot of game theory and I'm also director of our master's program 
in economics and quantitative economic analysis and policy. So I always teach one graduate course every semester, and that's in game theory or managerial economics or monetary policy. And with monetary policy, I also coach our college Federal Reserve Challenge team. And I'm happy to say they've won the nationals in the country more than any other university in the United States, including Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, University of Pennsylvania, UCLA, Columbia, and NYU. In the past seven years, we've won five times on the, in the nationals. And that's because we have our own recipe of doing things. And I'm not interested in working at pace so I can imitate Columbia and NYU because imitations are not as good as the real thing. And I would prefer to innovate my own way of doing things. So uh, I like to hear what Columbia and NYU are doing. They're great in a lot of ways. They're a nightmare in other ways. I wanna do what I wanna do at this point in life uh, because I think that's my job, not just to do what my professors did for me. Uh, the other thing I could tell you, I have a little bit of a different perspective. I ran my own company uh, for 30 years, had 15 employees working for me. And I sold that a couple of years ago. And now I started another company called Omnia. And that company does college advising, financial aid, consulting, and career consulting for high school students who are trying to decide which college to go to, how to finance that education without ruining 25 years of the rest of their lives or their parents' lives, and, uh, and what you do with a college diploma. Because going to college and spending upwards of sometimes $300,000 per student, and then saying, well, now I wonder what I'm going to do next, seems like an especially bad idea to me. If I were to ask you for a $300,000 investment, and you were not quite sure what it would be good for after you obtain the completion of having vested in that investment. So that's what I'm really all about. Uh, I live in Manhattan, right next to Pace, but it was very quick getting down here. So I'm very happy I can join you today. And uh, I do have broad interests. And you would, you would call someone like me an economic imperialist. Uh, I do work on non-neuronal organisms and how they make decisions. Like for example, how do algae make decisions or jellyfish, bacteria, or uh, cobras, snakes, right? Um, do they make decisions? I assure you they do. Are they good decisions? Very good. They do much better than people as a percentage. Otherwise, they wouldn't have existed for millions of years. They would have been extinct. So they have to be making good decisions or they can't survive under very difficult circumstances. So what I do is really wide ranging. It's a methodology more than a subject, but in the international realm, um, I've worked the equivalent of two and a half years in China, living in Shanghai uh, between 1999 and, two and pre-COVID. Uh, I was in China once or twice a year for two or three months each visit. And I'm a visiting professor at USST, University of Shanghai for Science and Technology, which is one of the big universities there. We have about mm, 32 to 35,000 students. And it's a huge area, huge uh, enterprise they have there uh, compared to PACE, which we only have 13,000 students. And in addition to that, I've been on travel courses in China and in Brazil. And um, I like international stuff. I went to uh, Tbilisi in Georgia and other cities in Georgia to help recently restructure their teaching program in economics because they uh, had a lot of professors who had degrees that were obtained under a socialist or a communist system. And they wanted to know how do we teach in the United States when it comes to business and finance and economics? And what, is this something they should imitate? And to what extent? And how would they do it? And what resources do they need? And can we train them to do it? And that's what we did. So that was also pretty interesting. And I have to say that if you've ever been to Georgia or you have a chance to get to Georgia, uh, it's a great place to go to. Very small country very beautiful country.
well worth the visit. And you can drink the water. The water's gonna be more pure than it is almost anywhere in the world. Amazing and wonderful, delicious water. Very, very fresh and pure. Okay, so what do I think about economic sanctions? Not much, really. Um, I think about it, I keep track of it. Uh, do I have very strong opinions about it? I don't know if I have exceptionally strong opinions about it. Um, I do have ideas what works and doesn't work and what they're expected to accomplish and what they will not accomplish. Um, I teach international economics on an advanced level, usually once every two or three semesters. So for that reason, I stay up to date and I deal with a lot of questions and I work with students on a lot of projects and I enjoy them. I like international economics because it's a whole different perspective of thinking of the world. One of the big disadvantages that you get by being an American is everything you get, including from the media, but even from the universities and anyone on the street is you get an American centric position. And that is, is not the position if you travel, if you go to China or Georgia or Russia or uh, the Ukraine or Brazil or Colombia or Vietnam, you get a different perspective there. The perspective is vastly different vastly different in uh, ways that are shockingly different. I don't think it's possible to know a country in a way that's intelligent and comprehensive unless you go there for somewhat of an extended period of time and understand what it's like living there and being there and what they're about, where they're coming from and what their goals are for the future. So that sensitized me for that. So the best I can do regularly is I can read The Economist once a week because that comes out of the uh, UK. So that has its own bias because uh, the UK is, you know, everything a great country should be after it stopped being a great country. So you're getting that perspective from the British. But on the other hand, certainly not an American perspective. And when you read about what they think of the United States, it's like as if we don't live in the United States. So it's always interesting, but I think it helps you stay more informed and you have to take it with a grain of salt because uh, any foreign country I did any serious work in was not what I expected it to be based on my uh, pre-ground, pre-travel briefing that I received and studying about it in, uh, with the US resources that I had available. These did not prepare me for what I actually discovered. Which, which really surprised me and still does, even though I expect that to be the case now. So um, I will give a disclaimer. I do not make a, uh, any assertion that I have been woke. I woke this morning a little bit later, but I feel good now. And uh, I am not at all under a uh, 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 compulsion to feel that I'm politically correct. I'm an equal opportunity offender. Uh, you will not find me to be Republican or Democrat, not too liberal, not too conservative. And uh, there is no political philosophy that I can claim kinship with at the moment. So if you are a dedicated Republican, Libertarian, Communist, Socialist, Democrat, or uh, anarchist, you will not find uh, a kindred soul here. I believe that uh, you should think for your own self. And if you are using the media, well, let's put it this way. I've given up watching uh, cable and uh, streaming forms of media in its entirety. I just look at them to keep in touch with them. We've said important things like Portrait Williams dying in a motorcycle accident or Julian uh, Sands being lost in, in uh, California. And, and that's good gossip. And and who's pregnant and who's getting divorced. And it's like reading the National Enquirer. It, it doesn't mean too much. And if something is in, whether it's the Post or the Times or the Wall Street Journal, uh, some papers I do put a higher value on because they will not print a lot of stuff from unnamed sources. But in general, just because it says something in the paper, I don't see it as a, uh, a revelation from the Lord Almighty directly to me. So uh, I apologize in advance 
if anyone will be offended. It's not my um, uh, intention to be offensive, though. Although uh, I would say 90% of my students enjoy the presentation and 10% uh, think it's something that is atrocious and should be stopped at all costs. But I'm still employed by my employer, so I assume they agree with the 90%, at least uh, since I heard from them last. So at this point, um, uh, Fred, between Fred and Rebecca, you have a uh, really nice, super concise summary about uh, economic warfare and different methods of conducting it with examples and that sort of thing. And they even have discussion questions. And I went through it and I said, this is exactly the kind of thing I should talk about. But I think you guys read this because you're not like a lot of my students and you're not forced to come here. You do it voluntarily. So I think you probably read it already. Now, maybe certain things you question or you'd like further clarification on. So I'm happy to do that. And there may be certain things here that were omitted, cannot be completely comprehensive. And I'm happy to talk about that. But as Fred said, if you have any general questions about anything from what the Federal Reserve is doing right now to political or economic or political economy questions that are transglobal in nature, uh, the, the worst I can do is tell you I have no idea. Now, if you're having trouble finding the answer to it, I may have some advantages because I can, I can hit resources that you may not be aware of. So of course, I'm very happy to take your email or your cell number. And uh, if I can't answer it, that would intrigue me. And I would definitely follow it up with you and tell you what I could find. So I can't represent myself as uh, the oracle because uh, again, I have no uh, communication with the divine and I am not psychic. I don't speak to the dead or anything else that's popular these days among many people. So with that, you should be uh, very relaxed. Uh, you look uh, more mature and more intelligent than a lot of the student groups that I teach. You're not as little, you're not as bashful. Uh, you've probably done more in life than my average 18 year old that I get as a freshman. So um, let's have a chat. And uh, by all means, a signal if you have a question a comment that you want me to respond to? Something that's bothering you at the moment in this area? I'll start off if I may. There Please. Economic sanctions, and you say you have other methods. Can you give us a few of your examples of what you feel may be more operative in the current situation or past situation? In terms of resources I have? Hmm. Uh, from a country standpoint, what can we do in these days other than economic Well, any economic sanction has carve outs. So one of the things you first want to do is if you look at an economic sanction, you have to ask yourself how it's being uh, gotten around. So when it comes to any economic sanctions being applied to Russia on oil, uh, that's not keeping the Kremlin or Putin up at night. So if they want to sell their oil, I assure you they can sell their oil. They can sell their oil by transshipping. What they can do is they can ship their oil to uh, anywhere from Iran to Nigeria to any number of uh, oil exporting nations, and then that can be transshipped from there. So Russian oil that may have come out of the ground in Russian territory can be relabeled. And oil is oil if you're selling uh, sweet, heavy crude, right? then that's sweet, heavy, crude. It doesn't have a forensic identification that you can tell you exactly where it came from. You can just uh, narrow down the possibility. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, even with the restrictions on Russian oil, if the price of Russian oil falls below $60 per barrel, you're allowed to buy it in Europe. So I assure you the Germans buy a ton of Russian oil for all their speeches that they've made. Uh, they're, they're a significant contributor to the Russian oil market. And um, I hope they have good relations with the Russians 
because if they ever have to fight Russia as a NATO member, they'll have to ask Russia to supply them with the energy to bomb the Russian locations. So the, the, the Germans are probably the most uh, difficult to understand in terms of an integrated and coherent uh, foreign policy. But that's true with their policy in China. And if you follow their antics in China, uh, one of my one of the firms, the German firms I really respect is Siemens. You know, they have really some fantastic technologies. So Siemens happily went to China. They built magnetic levitation trains with the Chinese. And of course, the Chinese threw them out, essentially. And now are getting all these nice projects in Africa and Asia using maglev technology, which they can produce a lot cheaper than the Germans can. And they have no need for the Germans at all now. So why the Germans would have agreed you know, you have to look at the benefits they got, the amount of profit they made in China compared to all the benefits they're losing down the road from business they could have had in other countries, which now the Chinese will take probably as part of their Rust and Belt initiative. And, uh, and uh, you know, you have to understand that Merkel, uh, I agreed with her back in 1995, 1999, I agreed with her in terms of, you know, that you could have relations with China that were heavily uh, commercial and trade with them. And, and this will create, produce a new world order of globalization and peace and competition without warfare. So, but I think since uh, in the 2000s already, this becomes progressively more of a, a fantasy. And the fact that Merkel still doesn't admit a policy error here is to the detriment of, uh, the German people and uh, the entire German uh, worldview. I'm sorry, uh, I want to redirect the question. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying, and any control is there are nefarious ways of getting around control. I'm sure there are individuals. What I was mainly trying to get an idea from your perspective is what worked or what would work in certain situations better. And these specific economic yeah. Um, economic sanctions generally don't work that well. In terms of the goal they're supposed to achieve. So to destabilize, overthrow the communists and promote democracy in Cuba. So you have an embargo that's been going on for six decades. Hasn't worked, right? Has it impoverished the Cuban leadership or the military? No. If you're, if you're a high member or in the inner circle or even close to the inner circle of the Communist Party, you have your Mercedes, you can travel all over the world, you have access to the best medical care, you, you have wonderful living conditions, um, and that's not going to change unless you lose power in Cuba. So uh, what did the embargo accomplish? it gave the Communist Party an excellent excuse for why they failed. Cuba is the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, right? They, they are, their conditions are, are marginally above subsistence, marginally, right? So what do you blame that on? You blame that on the fact that your largest, uh, the largest economy in the world, it's 90 miles away, and they have em embargoed you. And they've created economic conditions that make it impossible for you to succeed. And that's ridiculous. That's a horribly ridiculous excuse. And in fact, recently, more so than ever, because both Obama and Biden gave them a significant period of time to improve their relationship with the United States. And by the way, the United States has given the condition for Cuba to have the embargo removed. And Cuba doesn't meet that condition, which they could do within six to 12 months. Have everything that they want, trade and tourism. And they refuse to do it. And the reason they refuse to do it is because of the fact that they can't open up their economy to trade because if they open up the internet and there's more contact with business people and American travelers, 
the Cuban people are going to uh, demand change at a rate that uh, the Communist Party there can't supply it. So, and don't want to supply it. So, at this point, the onus is on Cuba, not the U.S. The U.S. doesn't need Cuba, but Cuba does need the U.S. By the way, there's still about um, 350 to 450 million in trade that goes on between the U.S. and Cuba, mainly from the U.S. to Cuba. Um, and that's in uh, medical supplies and food. And that's allowed. And in addition to that, there are diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Cuba, which were reestablished under uh, Obama. They do. And that's one of the problems with sanctions, because it doesn't apply to third parties. Now, initially it did in the 1960s, but even by the end of the 60s, Cuban countries were breaking through that and trading with Cuba, despite the consternation of the United States. So you have to be willing to apply sanctions to your own allies and trading partners to really insist that those sanctions are not porous. So the economic sanctions, if you expect them to accomplish anything in and of themselves, it's, it's absurd. I think Cuba is a great example. I think China and Russia are better examples. Russia is now prepared to go the next 10 or 20 years in Ukraine with US uh, and European sanctions imposed every step of the way. That is not going to in any way deter the Russians. And with the Chinese, quite the contrary, that has motivated the Chinese to actively look to further undermine the US globally, especially in the financial realm, because the Chinese are trying to imitate what the US does with the, with the, with the dollar as an international reserve currency, providing a possible uh, bypass route or alternative to the dollar. And if they can do that, they'll do more damage to the United States than the US could ever do to China. So uh, there's always the uh, problem that sanctions may explode in your face. So you should realize anytime we impose sanctions on any country, we hurt our own country's economy. We grow slower, we create more unemployment, and we produce more inflation from that. That's unavoidable if the sanctions are having an impact. So you can't hurt your left hand to help your right hand. You can't hurt a country that's part of a global ecosystem that involves connections on many different levels without expecting there to be a counter reaction against you. So the question is, are you prepared to deal with that counter reaction? And is it relatively acceptable, minor in size? discussion that we had last week on U.S.-Chinese relations and this week's focus on sanctions, which really mostly talked about uh, U.S.-Russian relations, rather. It's interesting that, that they kind of missed that in the discussion last week. Uh, but where do, you, where do you see diplomacy going? Nowhere. Nowhere. Where are the opportunities? Let's try it that way. At the present time, there are very few opportunities because the U.S., mainly because of the US. The China position, I think, is especially clear. The Chinese say, Formosa is us. Taiwan are the people who lost our civil war. We see this, and they've always said we see this as our territory, right? Now, if you look at the map, looks like it could be their territory, but that's not the way the politics played out because of the Cold War and the timing where it happened. Now, if the U.S. wants to continue a Cold War, they're not acting that way. If you want to continue a Cold War, you have to spend at least five or maybe six percent of your GDP on the military, because the Pacific is very far away. It's 15 and a half hours flying time. 
Now, if you want to project your power there, you better be spending at least several hundred billion more on your military than you are. And if you're not, you're sending a signal that we'd like this, but we can't do this. And if you're watching the number of uh, actual occurrences where US and Chinese forces are encountering each other in the Taiwan Straits, in the South and the East China Sea, you are already on a very quick buildup to an accident. And that accident will probably not result in a triggering of a war, even though you never know. Uh, but, you know, remember the main, you never know. But um, wouldn't be good. And it would push us a lot closer to war. So there's a couple of incidents every week, which are, which are very bad between Chinese and American uh, naval and, and, uh, and Air Force assets. And, uh, and the diplomacy is, uh, is, is simply uh, sugarcoating by the Biden administration to not recognize the threat that's there. So uh, whether Biden says, yes, we would defend Taiwan or our official position is strategic ambiguity, right? That doesn't help the Chinese know what the hell we're talking about. So the Chinese, they don't even know what we're all about. They see a weather balloon, which is their, one of their main spy assets flying over the US. They even wondering why don't the Americans shoot it down? Then they shoot it down after it goes more than halfway across the country, right? And, uh, and then they uh, retaliate against the US, even though they're intrusive, right? So you can't handle China from a point of view of weakness. And the Biden administration's weakness in this area is profound. So the Chinese just wake up every morning. They get an intelligent briefing that they give to Xi Jinping. And he asks them, everything OK with Biden? They say, sure, good. Is Harris still the vice president? Good. Yeah, great. Is there anything new that's happened in this theater? No. OK, now let's look at the diplomatic cables. And now you just laugh or you shake your head or you frown because there's no signal. What does the US want to do with China? They want apparently the biggest thing the US wants to do with China and uh, Blinken is so proud of is environmental discussions, which the Chinese are to be congratulated for, for not laughing hysterically, because that's hard for them to do because it's the last thing on their minds, but they know it's very important to the Americans. So they use that politically against the United States and diplomatically against the United States. And the US would say it's a breakthrough. And to the Chinese, it is, um, well, what Stalin used to say, it, it's the US playing the role of a useful idiot. And uh, that's it. Now the Chinese do not want a war with the US, but they're willing to risk it. If it becomes a war, they're willing to go through with it. And if there are equal casualties on each side, let's pick a horrendous amount, 400 million in casualties on each side. This is nothing to the Chinese because number one, you'll have no one living in this country. And number two, you'll have the majority of Chinese people who are doing fine because they have 1.4 billion people. And the Chinese have made frequent remarks that we have an equal number of losses or double the losses of the Americans. We have a country. What do they have? Nothing. And the rebuild on that would only favor China. So China is not like the US. They take the long view. They think that this century is the China century. I think this century is the China century. So they don't mean the whole century. The uh, 100th anniversary of the founding of China is going to be in what, 2049, 2050, around there, right? So if they have to begin from there after a limited nuclear conflict, that's okay with them. They're prepared for that. They're actively preparing for that. The US is not. So the Chinese are not going to accept the new era of capitulations. They do not recognize the West as a Pacific power, even though the West is a Pacific power. 
So they want to make a redefinition of history to when China was a supreme Pacific power. They don't want to live in New York or Boston or occupy Chicago or Washington, but they want hegemony, uncontested hegemony within their sphere, which is a very large sphere, the way they draw the map. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very high. Yeah, very high. I would say if uh, Biden is reelected, if the Biden's Har Biden Harris ticket is reelected and they don't invade Taiwan, it would really surprise me. I would be shocked and I would have to say that I made a miscalculation because um, where are you going to get another four year window? You know, if you had a Trump or a DeSantis, whatever their views are on the Ukraine, they can't allow for Taiwan to touch Taiwan. <laughs> I'm already coming up with a new name for Taiwan, Taiwan, for China to take over Taiwan. They can't do it because we're in a position where it would abrogate all our defense treaties with Australia and Japan and South Korea and the Philippines and Vietnam. How would you do that? Well, with all these specific nations, they're under our nuclear umbrella. And we, all, and we claim that we, we have mutual defense cooperation with them. For the first time, Japan exercises in the, the, the most recent NATO uh, air maneuvering exercise, right? And that's under the assumption that Japan in the future may well be fighting with NATO forces in the Pacific. So um, Japan... If they're told by the Americans, you know, you're on your own, they have no need for the United States. Then, and, and at this point, I think they may have made a decision already they have no need for the United States. Because I would be shocked if Japan did not develop its own nuclear capability within the next three to five years. Do we have that agreement with Taiwan right now? Because it's kind of nebulous. Specifically. Yeah, it's nebulous. See, the US has not said, you know, Biden has come the furthest out in saying that, yes, we would kind of said it like in the last few years. Yeah, but that uh, can't be taken seriously because the uh, Chinese are aware the Americans don't have the military firepower to follow up on that. They don't have the firepower. If you have a shooting war with China, China now, you'll be out of ammunition in less than a month. You have no missiles. So what are you going to do? Run at them with uh, your fists and with a police stick? Can't do it. Chinese know that too. The Americans know it as well, so they can call their bluff. So uh, the, the uh, Taiwan um, Defense Act is, says that we have an obligation to supply them with weapons. But it's not like an Article 5 trigger at uh, NATO. We don't have to fight for them or with them. However, we always hold that open as the implication. Now, right now, a lot of that was done. Well, in the past, a lot of that was done with maneuvering around of our aircraft carriers. So we have, uh, I'm going to say, eight or nine aircraft carriers. So we have 12 aircraft carriers. None of them are all functional at the same time. Always one or two or three are down for six months to a year at a time for repairs. So they can't go out to sea. So you have, let's say, eight or nine that are functioning. And they have so many responsibilities all over the world that I'm going to say you could get three or four into uh, the Pacific in range of uh, China and Taiwan. And they're already are denied access to that theater by Chinese we uh, missile technology. So unless you want the Ronald Reagan to go there with 10,000 sailors on board and be struck with multiple missiles and sunk, you can't bring that into into a uh, destination on theater. The other thing is, what are you going to do? You're going to attack from Guam? If, you, if China decides to invade Taiwan, they're going to attack Guam first. And they're going to neutralize your bases there without warning. They're going to missile it. Massive missile strike on Guam, Diego Garcia, and, and Okinawa, 
and all the locations where you have significant U.S. basing. So those troops will be destroyed on the ground right away. And they're close. And the Chinese have hypersonic missiles. And now I'll do my impression of Biden. And we don't. I'll magnify it. And we don't have hypersonic missiles. But the Russians and the Chinese do. So a hypersonic missile can do conservatively 4,000 miles an hour. And if you look at your map, figure it out. Within 20 minutes, you can destroy that entire base or a series of bases. So the US does not have the resources in place that are needed uh, and, and, and most ashamedly submarine technology where we excel in globally, you only have about 75 submarines that can, have, uh, that can function now in the US Navy and they're on global assignments. You have 95 and 20 are under repair all the time. So the Chinese have about 100 submarines. So they're not as good, but they get better and better. And the Chinese build 50 fighting ships a year, and we build four. You don't need a CIA analyst to think about that. Chinese have the largest Navy in the world. So the US, uh, unless they wanna be nostalgic, has less and less relative ability to deter a Chinese attack against Taiwan as each day goes on. And uh, they don't want a war, so they have to do it at a time where they think that the US will go to the UN and impose economic sanctions. The way the Chinese would do it, they would start with a naval blockade of Taiwan. The only way they'll do that is if they're convinced that if they impose a naval blockade, the U.S. is going to deploy all the assets off base and send them out to sea. So if that's the case, they have to be destroyed before they can be, be uh, launched. So the Chinese would have to play ahead and say, where is this going to go if we do a naval blockade? Now, naval blockade could be challenged by the US. And it could get very hot, and it would be enough of a delay where it would be an example of brinkmanship. And, uh, and that kind of situation could easily cause a, uh, a replay of uh, the nuclear uh, poker game that took place in 62 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Say that again? You do not have JFK this time. I don't see the problem. You have two uh, men with an exceptionally long amount of experience who will probably be president. The only way you could find men who have more experience, you would have to go to the local nursing home. <laughs> the 3 a.m. call. I hope it's not at 3 a.m. I hope it's at 3 p.m. Because I know, I don't know yet what it'll be when I'm 80 years old, but when I'm 80 years old and you wake me up at three in the morning, I think I'm just going to go back to sleep based on what medicines I took before I went to sleep. I'm not making fun of old people. I'm older too now. But uh, I'm just saying that uh, it's a very stressful thing. Isn't it? Huh? Um, I'm not trying to change the fact. The one thing that really puzzles me is the USA helps China to get in the world economic forum, right? There's an absolute blame commitment, even down to the medical sciences, COVID, and our leading new economy. They won't even declare a problem with the pork industry to the national government. What is with that? They came into the world community and have just not lived up to any expectations of that. The problem is that the architecture of the global trade system is really still under the WTO. And the WTO in the past 20 years, has be uh, 25 years, has become a joke. Since 
it's masterful manipulation under Bill Clinton, right? You remember 1999? Do you remember the millennial round in Seattle where there was rioting and anarchy and the round had to be stopped? Do you remember how it was restarted two years later in Doha in the year 2001? Do you remember how, what an abject failure it was? And for the past uh, 22 years, they've been unable to conclude another agreement, right? The WTO has essentially become an irrelevancy, all but an irrelevancy. So normally you go to the WTO and you initiate a discussion, China should be removed from the WTO. And you use that as continuing leverage. But the Clinton administration was as uh, strong of will as the Biden administration. They were determined that China should get into the WTO when it did ascend to WTO. And they were premature. They shouldn't have pushed it so fast because China was making changes up until then. And then they said, well, when we, once we get into the WTO, all the members break the rules anyway. So we'll break the rules too. What are you going to do? And the WTO has, no, has never had even when it was the GATT, an efficient enforcement mechanism. So there's not much you could do. Now, what was promising was, this, was the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But you know that Trump pulled out of that as soon as he was elected. And now Japan anchors it, but that's not the same as the US as being the anchor member. If the US does not want to play the free trade game, it should right away know from its history it has to play the military game. If you want to be more isolationist, then you better have a terrific military because eventually you're going to have to use it. The French essayist Montaigne said, if goods and services do not freely cross borders, ultimately armies will. I think that's a very reasonable statement in light of human history and civilization. You either trade or you fight. You don't have a lot of other choices. You need stuff that other countries have. They want stuff that you have on all different types of levels. How are you going to get it? You can either do it economically through some measure of trade, or you have to take it by force, like Saddam Hussein did with Kuwait in order to rationalize oil prices in his favor. This is what history teaches us. No? Martha, so compare and contrast to Japan when in uh, 1958 to 2016, come out of World War II, the U.S. is completed in 75% of the global GDP. Now we're about 23%. China's about 19%. A reserve currency typically lasts for 93 years. We've been a reserve currency for 100. If you play out the way China's thinking, economically, business and whatnot, in addition to military, or the business, the technology ramifications, what's the scenario you see potentially by 2050, which would speak to earlier about the banner year 2049-2050? And the problem is with, uh, I, I think we're distinguishing now in the financial end of things, right? So business is now uh, shifting its focus to Asia. Right, The real growth is going to be in Asia because you either have mature economies or you have economies that have very slow growth rates in Europe and Canada and the United States and the more developed countries. So if you're a business and you want to increase your profits quickly, you have to turn your attention to Asia and possibly Africa because that's where you can get that growth in your numbers. So business-wise, the shift has to be continuing to Asia Pacific region. Financially is not so clear. Uh, the greatest US uh, advantage may still be the US dollar. So the reason for that is that it's, uh, there's no set cycle for uh, currencies uh, rise and fall. Rise and fall of currencies are usually connected to major wars. And the reason for that is the policies of the countries that conduct the war. So look at World War I. Prior to World War I, it was the British pounds, right? 
everything revolved around England financially, including the United States to a, more, to a greater or lesser extent. But then Europe got involved in World War I. They were determined to win World War I. It was a good idea, but they didn't have the money to win World War I. To win a war, you need a lot of money. And more than that, you need resources. You need wealth. And money is just uh, one manifestation of your resources. Britain didn't have that. So after World War I, they were warned by Keynes, Jonathan Maynard Keynes, not to go back to such a strong pound tied to gold because of the fact that it was not realistic in terms of the market conception of the British pound. So as a result, the British pound lost its popularity and it fell in value. And very quickly, there has to be a substitute to complete that. And the substitute was New York City and the US dollar. So the US was clearly ascendant. And after World War II, the US was uniquely ascendant. So that means that the Americans were intelligent enough at that time with leadership that it realized that they had an opportunity now to reconstruct the global world order in trade, uh, with, uh, in trade, in politics, and in finance. And that's what they did. Now, um, China can't do that. Russia can't do that. No other country can do that. So the reason is because China doesn't have free-floating exchange rates. They don't have capital mobility. They use capital controls. They limit how money can both flow in and flow out of their economy. And that is counterindicated for a good international reserve currency. So the renminbi can never be a good reserve currency as long as those capital controls are so strict. Now, can the Communist Party disband with those capital controls to a large extent? They can't, because if they do, they're going to be subject to economic issues based on their own mismanagement that can cause a political collapse. Or at least the end of a, of a communist party of China. They are not willing to trade that off because there's only one party rule. There's no government in China, this party in China. There's a government in the US still that is inhabited by elements of two major parties and maybe a few minor ones. But in China, there's no government, there's no constitution. There's only a party state and they have to maintain capital controls and they have to be concerned because their entire economy still is an export driven economy. And that means they can't let floating exchange rates occur. They just can't do it. And if they want to lower their exchange rate to export more and, and lower unemployment, what they have to do is they have to print more RMB and they have to use that to buy US securities and other government securities. So where do they get the Chinese as a relatively poor country get all the money to buy this amazing amount of US treasuries, right? They print the money. They have a monopoly on printing Chinese money. But when they print the Chinese money, that becomes part of their money, their money base, their money supply. And that pushes them always towards inflation. And if that inflation doesn't show up in product prices, it shows up in financial markets like their housing market. And that's why they have a housing crisis in China. And that's why they have a debt crisis in China. So Russia is not even close to having the type of stability in their currency and internal financial operations to offer the world a reserve currency internationally. China could do it, but not as a monoparty communist state. So the US remains financially and business-wise in many ways 
the tallest midget in the room. If you're five feet tall and everyone else is four feet or less, you are a giant. Everything in business and finance is relative. But it does not speak to incredibly intelligent US policy. And by the way, the more you rely on sanctions, the more you provide incentive for countries to find ways to get around your financial architecture and your currency. Now, what will digital currencies accomplish? This remains to be seen. Initially, I don't think a lot, but if the US handles it wrong, they could damage the role of the, of the dollar as the international reserve currency. Right now, about 40% plus, somewhere between 40 and 50% of all global financial transactions are conducted in dollars. Even though you're right, we only produce what, 22% or so of planetary GDP. We'll get you next. I know you like Anthony. I'm just hoping I like diplomacy as opposed to war. It would be preferable. And, and, and you're making the point that I think uh, credibly that neither China nor the United States wants a war, nor, nor anyone else wants to see a world war. So, what is the role? What are the rational things for an American diplomat to do? Is it to concede the disturbed influence of Taiwan? There are two things, there are two approaches you can take. There are two approaches you can take. One of those is you can gradually diminish your support for Taiwan. That's the approach that I would probably take, but I would do it in consultation with our allies, especially in Europe, because I would make it very clear to them that if the US is in danger of fighting a two front war to accommodate the Europeans, and they don't feel that they're in that same position, I would go the Trump way. And I would tell them from now on, you're on your own with Russia. Unless we're, you're really an ally on a global scale, because the US needs that right now. They don't need a Macron, or they don't need a European uh, bloc that says that we shouldn't be with the US opposing uh, China's hegemonic rise. So I, I would try and make that clear diplomatically that uh, forget about it. It's not gonna be that way. If you want it that way, we'll have to make an adjustment in our policy. And I would still give them support. I would just cut back on it dramatically. Now, the Taiwanese for years have not taken their situation seriously. There are no Israel. So they have not taken the steps that they've been told they need to take to make themselves into a porcupine. They have to be a porcupine. If the bear looks at them, it has to look at something that doesn't look like it's gonna taste nice swallowing. They have to be extremely difficult to ingest within communist China, but they're not, they're not. And a significant amount, amount of Taiwanese have not made up their mind if they're willing to fight. And the younger generation especially does not appear willing to fight. They look for deferments out of the military, even if they have to gain 30 or 40 pounds in order to do it and be rejected, right? Now, if you don't, the Ukrainians, I don't think are like that, right? So. If you're Taiwan and you're saying, oh, the Americans would step in, the Japanese or the South Koreans would, step, would step in, I would say, you're on your own. But I would make sure that we have a foolproof way to get semiconductors first. Because outside of the semiconductors, Taiwan has no... Uh, overriding priority to the United States geographically or tactically that we can't gain from other countries in the area. Yeah, but you won't be able to do it because you don't have the materials you need. The materials, uh, uh, how much of the materials do the Taiwanese buy from the mainland? 
do you know there's a huge amount of trade between Taiwan and China? You know, for all, all, the, all the talk, you go to Shanghai or you see that restaurant, they're owned by Taiwanese. You see that, that's a Taiwanese home improvement chain. That's a chi Taiwanese furniture uh, chain, right? So business contacts and investment go across straits all the time. So we have to talk to the Taiwanese and tell them that our destiny is not to have a war to keep you free. So that's one possibility. You have to recognize your limitations. So, so say it again. That'd be a diplomatic approach because I don't think you need the same posture as you needed uh, 40, 50 years ago or even 25, 30 years ago. And, on, and, and frankly, I understand the Chinese position. The Chinese position is this is an island that's close to us. We won the civil war. The Reds won, not the whites. They fled here. We don't give up this territory just because they're occupying it. We want it, and it's part of our conception of a unified China. And the fact that you're there reminds us of everything from the opium wars to the capitulations. We want you out. So there has to be a new security structure, a NATO-like security structure for Asia that does not include Taiwan, but does include close work with our other allies there. And you tell the Taiwanese that we're quite trying to give you some of what you want, but you will not get hegemonic monopoly influence over the Indo-Pacific region. That should be the long-term goal. Now, the other way to do it is you can take the Reagan approach, which was also successful. The Reagan approach would be you're never going to accomplish what you want because you know what? We're going to add, even if we can't recruit, recruit Air Force pilots now, we're going to have so many drones, so many automated ships, so much equipment in your area that your costs are just not worth it. You have to harden that target up. And, if you can, and the other thing that should be done is frankly, you need a little bit of a Masada complex there. If the Taiwanese are going to be overtaken, they have to destroy in totality all chip making capability. They have to blow up all their facilities and destroy them. Just to level the field. If the Chinese can't get them, the Americans won't get them, the Europeans won't get them. That'll cause a change through the market. May take 10 years, may take 20, but that'll cause a nice evolution. But that has to be destroyed. Like NVIDIA and AMD don't make their own chips, they make them all at Taiwan Semi. So it's the second degree of the war of economy. <laughs> right. You have to, you have to, well, any threat that's credible has to do you damage as well. You have to wire the plants with the right explosive technology. And then you say, once we feel that you've begun this, they will be destroyed. And now you have to begin a supplemental operation where you decide how you're going to react if you have to give up Taiwan, Taiwan as a semiconductor supply source. Does that include the plants that are already being built in China? Does, Does that, that include? Does that technology transfer? Does that include the plants within China? No. The technology is already transferred? No. You can't do that because then you have to have an attack on mainland China <clears throat> and your escalation there is highly likely then. Because then the, why don't they attack your semiconductor facilities or your defense plants on the mainland here? Do you think Taiwan would actually do that? Because well, I, I wouldn't give them a choice on the matter. Okay, so the U.S. would not give them a choice. No. I wouldn't negotiate that with Taiwan. I would say if you feel that you don't le like our suggestions, don't take them. But I make it very clear uh, off the record that you're not going to get a U.S. military response. And if they want to deal with that and they have the guts of the Ukrainians and the technology and the, and the fierceness of spirit to make it uh, uh, not worthwhile for Taiwan to... Ta uh, I think this is a new word I came up with, Taiwan. For, for China to attack Taiwan, 
then uh, good for them. I, I like an underdog too. I'll root for them, but I'm not going to see uh, millions of Americans die for them. That I don't see any uh, reason for. Just like I don't see any reason for millions of Americans to die for Europe. If the Europeans were that worried about the Russians, they shouldn't have run down their militaries. They shouldn't have constructed Nord Stream 2. So apparently they were not that worried. I'm not more worried than they are. They're a lot closer than me. Right? And the Germans still haven't done anything to increase their military. And the war's been going on since February of 22. You'd think that if it was a priority to them, they'd increase their military already. They've done absolutely nothing. According to their Minister of Defense. So I'll take his word. Not anyone else's, since he's the German Minister of Defense. And he says he doesn't have the resources to fight a war and defend Germany. I don't give a damn. The U.S. I know can survive without Germany. Why do I care? They'll have to be less Eurocentric. They'll have to be more American-centric. I don't think the Russians can uh, occupy Europe and dominate Europe at any point in the future. They don't have the military or the economic capacity for that. Uh, I think they can gradually expand their borders, and that can be a long-term project. But if that doesn't bother the Europeans, then why did they form the EU? Why did they believe in NATO? Obviously, they don't take it that seriously. I can't understand why any NATO country is below 2% mandatory spending now on the defense, given the nature that there's a fighting war. Huh? I have no, ex I have no, I don't think that can be justified rationally with any argument. I've yet to hear it. If you see what the Russians are capable of, including threatening nuclear attack, right? And you don't increase your military and your capability substantially, right? You're probably not worried. If you're not worried, I'm not worried. Because they have a welfare state. They know the truth at this point. They don't have the money to have a military. You don't have an infinite amount of resources. Every resource, every dollar that you use for social welfare spending is a dollar that you can't spend on the military. So everyone says the U.S. should follow Europe. They have much better medical benefits. They have much better labor benefits. They have much better pension benefits, right? Yada, yada, yada. Yeah, of course they do. If you don't spend much money on your military, you can have a lot more on the other sectors of your economy. The U.S. spends now over $700 billion a year on the military. Well, what if you spent $400 billion a year on the military and you spent $300 billion more on social welfare programs, right? Well, I think you'd have a lot more social welfare programs. And any time the European countries have balanced their budget, which we don't seem to be able to do, they balance it on the back of the military, don't they? They don't cut the welfare state. They reduce their number of tanks, their number of troops, their number of fighter jets, their number of bombers, their number of logistic systems, their number of submarines, their number of destroyers and guided missile cruisers. But it's just simple accounting. You have to spend it on one thing or another, right? So with discretionary U.S. spending, the U.S. spends about half of our spending on the military and about half on non-military social programs, about 700 plus billion every year on each, 1.5 trillion a year on each. But that's only one third of our budget, remember. Two thirds of our budget is no political discussion at all. Two thirds of our budget is on entitlement. 
That's non-discretionary. Unless you change the laws in this country, that will only get higher and higher. In 25 years, that's going to be 80% of our entire budget on entitlement programs because of the changing demographics in the United States. So where will you get money to spend on the military? You don't have any. Where are you going to get people? Between the falling birth rates, your whole labor force is already shrinking. Your labor force participation rate is dropping. And young people, after they go through the public school system or even some private schools, would never serve in the military. They would consider that a dishonor. So these are facts. Now, what do you do with them? How much can you automate the military? I don't know. Maybe AI is going to be the best thing that ever happened. Whichever country has better computer programmers would win the war. They may win the war. The singularity. Okay. That we will be a remarkable in a good way. Well, they, they say mostly, but there are still people who see that negatively. You know, the, the AI, right. They kill it. Right, right. That, 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 that's, that's a worry by some people. Now, when you use the word singularity, what do you mean by that? What does that mean to you? So um, AI is obviously transformative, revolutionary. Um, I don't see evidence of any singularity. Uh, singularities are few and far between. They involve a complete new paradigm shift and uh, a, a true start in a whole opposite direction or different direction would be part of what a singularity would be all about. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, How would you define singularity? I wouldn't. Okay. The, the only singularity that I know of that has any definition is the singularity that was uh, preceding the Big Bang. You know, modern physics teaches us that the Big Bang occurred due to a singularity where you had an infinitely hot, microscopically, infinitesimally small point, which was not part of space, not part of time. And it blew up and caused the great inflation and the construction of time and space. So before the singularity in physics, there was no space, not even empty space. There was no time. Like to say, what was before the singularity? Nothing was before the singularity because the singularity means the whole concepts of space time begin with the singularity. So that means it's a whole, a wholly different model of reality, right? So AI is not headed to any singularity unless you first take the really, really good illegal drugs and have a little drink in you. And then you say, man, it's like a singularity or something, you know, this is all nonsense. Uh, AI is a, a brilliant uh, jump in technology. It will hurt some people because it will change the way a lot of things are done. Entire professions will go out of business, but we've been through this before, right? When cars were created, the singularity, you know, um, blacksmiths, carriage makers, um, uh, people who specialized in uh, making stables and, and treating horses, they'll all be going out of business, right? What will they do? the cars will be polluting more than the horses. Then we know what happened. That automobile industry created 
far more jobs by any multiple of the jobs that were created by a horse-driven economy. And pollution does what from the time the car is introduced? It tremendously drops. Tremendously drops, right? You have this huge global plummeting of pollution with the introduction of the automobile. And, and, and when I tell my students that they're, they're what? You know, but a horse is natural. Sure. Did you take a shit this morning? Now, what happens with a horse when you feed it good and it goes about its duty? Do you think it says uh, raising its front leg? Poor. Now it's time. I have to go to the bathroom. No. It goes all over the place. That creates flies and bacteria. That creates stink and plague. And if you go to many parts of the country, you have a parlor floor, you have a ground floor, you have a garden floor, right? Why? Why did architects build that way? Look at Brooklyn and Manhattan, right? Because on the floor that was even with street level, you couldn't live there because of the stink. The stink from the horses was unbearable. And the average time it took for a poor horse that died in the middle of a street while it was doing its work was two or three weeks to remove it. So that was wonderfully healthy for all sorts of plagues and diseases. The car, an enormous advancement in environmental cleanliness. Not the electric car, but what's been done over time with the combustion engine, you have the apparent ability of a combustion engine now to reach 50, 60 miles to a gallon. And that's incredible. And you probably can do other things to tone down the pollutants. But electric cars, forget it. Do you own an electric car? Do you buy one? You're the environmental pig. You're the biggest environmental pig of them all. And I just want to ask you one thing on your own ethics and morality. Did you reject that government subsidy? Or did you take my money and other people's money to buy your $100,000 car? Because you know what? It's amazing to me that if EVs are so good that the government has to bribe people in order to buy them. That's amazing to me. Why not just let car companies sell them? Toyota, you know, doesn't want to. A Honda's not crazy about the idea. Why would they be? This may very well be the end of their industry. So, but anyway, let me go back to that focus on technology. Technology is supposed to be disruptive. The best technologies that advance our standard of living are disruptive, and they're positive overwhelmingly in the long run, even nuclear energy. But in the short run, there are transition effects. There are switching costs, you call them, and they're painful. Many of them are painful. So what do you do? What can you do? You have to try and move forward if you want to solve a lot of the problems that the world has today. That's solved generally with improvements in science and the application of science, which is technology. So if you can conceive of something, you have to follow it through. Now, if you don't, someone else will. Um, in, in 70 and this is 25 plus years away, right? Yeah, I don't think he cares. 
I think uh, he has his idea for what his role in history, just like Putin does. And he feels he can get it to a certain point where China is the 21st century hegemonic power of the planet. Now, after that, it's what comes next. Actually move your information about your company, your company from one country to the next, and the country they're in says it's not going to happen. Yeah. How, how does that work in his mind? I think that um, in his mind, one of the things he believes is that China's a vast country with vast resources. And as they continue to develop, they're going to rely a lot on their internal resources for development. But I think, like you say, if you have the biggest military and you have other sources of soft power, um, such as uh, influence in the region, a variety of things, including financing and things like that, that um, you'll find your way, as the U.S. has. I mean, uh, did Abraham Lincoln worry about, you know, after his term of office, would the U.S. really function as a united republic and how would the future of the blacks in the country existing with the whites work out he may have thought a lot about it he may have found that interesting but it was certainly beyond the locus of his control so i don't think i think they're thinking of attaining a goal and then deciding now we have the luxury to decide what we're going to do with that goal I'm sorry, one more time, I didn't hear it. What do you think of the live golf and PGA oh. World Yeah, that was a big topic last semester. <laughs> well, you know, the Saudis and the other Gulf states, they love sports and they have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're throwing their weight around in golf and in soccer and in other areas, right? If you have the money, you can play the game. Um, I'm not a golfer. So it doesn't particularly disturb me. Um, I think um, it's interesting how the PGA uh, accommodated them and the resolution of that. Uh, the PGA obviously didn't see this as a fight that they were willing to make over a period of time. So uh, when I heard about it, I, was, I thought it was kind of funny, uh, not entirely unexpected. Uh, how it will change golf is a very interesting question, you know, as a professional sport, and that I don't know the answer to. But uh, did it depress me on any level or even cause me concern? No, because uh, I think that there's a change in thinking in the, uh, in the Gulf states and in uh, the Arab world, in the Middle East in general, about where they should be going and what they should be doing given the fact that they don't feel they can rely on America anymore. And they can't, they can't. When the Israelis have to decide what they can strike in Lebanon and what they can strike in Syria or Iran, the Russians have to be notified first. And shortly after that, the Chinese. And the Americans, they'll be told as well, but the Israelis and the Saudis and even the Turks, which are a NATO ally, they're increasingly going to do what's good for them because of the fact that the U.S. has already failed them. And do you want that failure to be on a minor level or do you want it to be on an existential level? So obviously they don't want it to rise to that occasion. So... I'm sure glad I have no advising to do to those governments right now because they're in a bad situation. Anytime there's a power vacuum, there's a bad situation. And if you want to thank anyone for that, you could send the thank you letters to Obama, Biden, and Trump. You could thank them and say they're, they're certainly responsible. 
why after the investment we made in Afghanistan, there's no major US military base in Afghanistan, I, I, I don't understand. I wish someone would explain it to me, especially since the hardware was all there already, although now it's been lost. Why there is no US major US military base in Iraq? Because Obama couldn't negotiate a, um, uh, a memorandum of status of forces agreement I have no idea. I mean, I would just say it's American stupidity more than anything else. So will this country pay a price for that? Terrible price they have to pay now for that. Terrible. Afghanistan gave you Ukraine. You would never have had Ukraine without Afghanistan. Because at the time, the Afghanistan situation was the lesson that had to be taught to the Russians and the Chinese. And I'm sure they learned the lesson fast, very fast, very fast. I want to hear it about American destroyer cutting across the bow of a Chinese frigate. But the U.S. does not have, I can't use a naughty word. So I'll use an international word. The US has no cojones for that. What are you gonna do? Send us a letter, a diplomatic cable of why you did it or not answer us or not meet at the next meeting? The Chinese by refusing to meet with the US and making it so wonderful for Blinken to go to China now, right? Plays the US like a violin. They play this country like a fiddle. I would say the US has no interest in meeting with the Chinese until they demonstrate they're gonna follow international protocols that are already established, including the law of the sea. And if they don't wanna follow that and they wanna open up a post in Cuba, we're gonna double our naval presence in the Pacific. And you know what we're going to do? Every Patriot system is going there to protect our bases. And don't worry, we'll get enough naval and air assets into the air that you're going to have a major problem if you try and do something that's an act of war. And let the Chinese worry about it. Chinese don't want a war. The US makes it almost impossible for them not to dream of invading Taiwan. What will happen? That the U.S. will respond that way? That the U.S. will respond that way? Never. 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 Are you saying why or right? Next question, right. <laughs> You've only reconfirmed my gloom for the future. Give us some highlights for the next five, ten years for America. Next ten years from America, what do I expect to see? I expect to see, number one, um, the Russia-Ukraine conflict to continue on for the foreseeable future. Number two, I expect to see the Taiwan situation with the U.S. heat up a lot more. Number three, I assume that the Russians will, within the next 10 years, use strategic nuclear weapons in the Ukraine. Number four, the Taiwanese, Taiwanese will be subject to a Chinese invasion within the next 10 years. But I'm not saying within the next 10 years, I'm saying that can happen in the next two or three years. Because if I was Chinese or Russian, that's how I would do my planning. And I have to assume they're smarter or at least as smart as I am. So therefore I think that's what they would do. And I think that the US will do absolutely nothing, nothing. They will uh, send them a letter and they will have a diplomatic condemnation. And that will just push us one more step to the new contours of the world of the 21st century. The United States economy will limp along as a pathetic thing with an average growth rate of between one and one and a half percent a year. The stock market will not enjoy the previous rallies that it's had. Unemployment 
will rain will will run surprisingly low. The labor force participation rate will continue to decrease. The fact that the unemployment rate runs low is because fewer and fewer Americans will be working. And if you're not looking for a job and you just decide I don't want to work, you are not unemployed. You are called a discouraged worker or in some ways marginally attached to the workforce. But it's not how we count unemployed. When we say the unemployment rate now is three point something percent, we mean out of all those people looking for work. You just made another list of bloody blue. Can you give us a highlight? <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, no, I think I can do that. Um, depending on what you do and where you live, you can have a very good life. So if you live in the United States, I could tell you where you're not going to be living. New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Illinois, California, Colorado. These are places that are going to continuously experience net outward migration of their residents and citizens. Which states are going to gain? Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. Texas, Arizona, and possibly three or four other states, they're going to pick up huge amounts of new citizens' residents. because And their economies will be prosperous. Remember, when I give you U.S. figures, right, that's a national average, right? That's a national average. The unemployment rate in, in, in New York City is like 9%. It's not three... Uh, point something percent. So you're going to have also cities that have unemployment rates of 2% and have economic growth in that city of the local GDP of five, six, seven, eight percent a year. And if you're living there and your friends are there and it's beautiful and they're building the infrastructure, yeah, you'll be fine. You just don't read the, the Times anymore. You'll read the Miami Herald or you'll read the, uh, I don't know, the Dallas Gazette or the Dallas Times, and, and you'll be fine. And they'll tell you what's going on in your region, right? And um, I think that'll happen in Europe too. I think you'll have a lot of people redistributing themselves across Europe and outside of Europe. I just spoke to a group of 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds, that range from Germany. They're all MBA students. Half of them can't wait to get the hell out of Germany. Half of them just can't wait to get out of Germany. Uh, some of them want to go here. So I already warned them. You better be careful where you go in the United States. You better be careful where you go in the United States. But you're welcome here. But they'll go to Canada. They'll go to Australia. They'll go to Israel. They'll go to Japan. You know, some of them will even go to China. I mean, a lot of Europeans in China who have really great businesses there or who work there, who teach there, and do consulting there. That path was open to me at one point, probably still is. Um, what else can you do? Go to Costa Rica. You can go to a lot of good countries where you can have a nice life. And they won't give a damn so much about what's going on. But um, the old template is being overwritten now. It's like an old computer program that's antiquated. It's a new template that's being established now. But everyone in this room can participate in it. You know, you could be, what are you guys, in your 20s and 30s? You could be, <laughs> can be in your 70s. You could be in your 80s today if you read the Wall Street Journal and see the stories in the personal section. And you could say, I want to start a life here. I want to do this. I don't want to be bound by this limitation anymore. I'm depressed about what I see going on. You don't have to wait to take a New York City subway every day until you have a close encounter of the first kind with the number six train. See the number second or third encounters when you're inside the train. The first encounter was when you're on the tracks and the train is coming. You don't need to have a first encounter with the number six. There's no law that says that. And God willing, 
I fully expect that within the next six years, I'll be living in uh, Florida. Unless the real estate goes so crazy there, I have to look in, uh, I like a warm climate, I have to be honest about that too. If everything was going ducky in New York, I would still uh, wanna go to Arizona or Texas or Florida. I like the warm climate, it's better for my arthritis. So that's one thing, and why not? But on the other hand, I have the big threes living in New York City now. I have crime, I have education, and I have taxes. What more do I need? <laughs> I have a horribly out of control crime situation. When I go out of my doorman building, I, I, I look around like I'm waiting to give the signal to launch the space shuttle or to launch a new rocket, you know? And there I go. Got to watch. Certainly got to watch. One good shove is all it takes. And I have a lot of enemies, you know, ones that don't know me or have never met me, but would still attack me. Yeah, right. Now, when it comes to education, we could be proud. New York City, we spend the most of any city in the world on students. You know how much we spend per student? Yeah, 37000 a year per student. That just about gets you into a private school. Might as well encourage development of private schools, which you do with, in a sense, with charters and magnet schools, and just give the people a tax credit and have them go there, have them send the kids there. You mean for non-humans, also for other extraterrestrials, everyone? Everybody goes, it's ridiculous. Because what do I think of universal ability? Do I think everyone has the same ability? If you're great with your hands and with spatial conception and you can make 100,000 plus a year as a carpenter or as a plumber, as an electrician or as a wood craftsman or whatever, and you hate studying, why are we gonna send you to a college? The Germans don't do it. Well, the high schools won't teach you anything. That Well, you have to define it. I mean, do I think that the Blasio accomplished anything with universal kindergarten? It's a joke. That's a joke. But um, universal schools, I mean, does that mean open admission to? School choice. School choice, I, I heavily believe in. But I believe in choice in general. I thought that's what the US is based on, the sanctity of individual choice as long as it doesn't infringe on the majority or other people, right? So when you tell me you want to kill a fetus, I don't give a damn. It's not mine. It's not my child. Does it offend me? Not in particular. You are, you're pro-life. You're pro-choice. Makes more sense to be pro-choice. The government shouldn't tell you about something like that. I would have to say under that definition, I would be pro-choice just in terms of making the decision. But if you tell me if you're poor, you have no choice but to go to a zone public school. You can't even go to the public school you want to go to. You have to want to go to the public school that the government tells you to go to, which you look up and you find is a garbage school with garbage teachers who are paid top dollar to do nothing. And functionally, 80% of the graduates are illiterate, so they can't go to college. In PACE, we're very liberal with our admissions. So we admit like 80% of the people who apply. And out of those 80%, out of that total, then we have 28% who drop out after two semesters. They don't drop out, they fail out. They can't do the work. Because when I'm teaching basic economics, I cannot teach them what the equation of a line is. If I teach them how to draw a line and how to write a line and find the slope and the intercept, that takes too much time for me to teach that to them for the first time. I ask them, what's 300% of four? No one in 150 students can give me the correct answer. Do you know what answer they tell me? 12. A 300% increase of four is 12. And I tell them, no. And they're all, what do you mean? Of course it's 12. They're thoroughly convinced it's 12. 
So then I drew a pie and I divided it into parts. That's what, second grade or third grade? And then I show them that and they look at me like, amazing. That's amazing. They all have high school diplomas. They all have high school diplomas. Don't worry about the SAT, that's racist, right? So you don't have to test them on that. Most racist thing I can think of is math, right? Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir. You had a question for a long time. Can I just ask you the the Taiwan problem? I agree with you that uh, most likely that that will happen, but I'm not too sure that I got your point uh, between the two, the China and the U.S. Who wants this problem with the war more than the other? China. China. Yeah. And also the next question. Is this In my opinion, yeah. although they don't want a war. The next question is that, do you think in their mind, the family better or the race is better? Do I think the? The China wants the war, but do you think the sooner is better or the later, later is better? Later. Sooner or later. Sooner or later. Sooner or later. In their mind. Yeah. If they could have a guarantee that Biden could keep being reelected till he's 96, then they would want it later. But recognizing the reality that whatever Republican you get in, if a Republican gets in in 24, will be more militarily hawkish than Biden, that has to be a major concern. So Trump, um, I believe, would have no choice but to develop a military response to um, <clears throat> a China aggression to Taiwan. <clears throat> I believe DeSantis, although I don't expect him to be president, would have to do the same thing or would a Pence or anyone else you would think of. I, I don't, th I think based on the constituencies that they represent most closely that the pressure would be on for that. I have no comment about uh, which uh, party will take the White House uh, that impact on the Chinese or Chinese issue. Uh, I see this problem is going to get bigger, but my hope, you know, somebody mentioned if it's a more political, that I feel that uh, based on my own experience, the longer we wait, which Biden is doing that to talk, communication, right? And the, the, the bank, right? This approach is the right approach. Why? I see the US, the best choice for US, if the history could uh, develop into military, science, science, technology, all these things we use in so many, the best choice, the strategy, is to delay. Why? That's the key. Why delaying this happening will benefit us? Because when you compare, clearly compare, you made a lot of quantitative comparison, the Navy, uh, the Army, or <coughs> resources, whatever. It's obvious. It's on the table. What's not on the table, and we cannot, we mean the US and the world, cannot see is <clears throat> something inside the country because no time have it. What happened? Think about 60 years ago. Mao Zedong had very big trouble 1959-1961-62. Beginning from 1963, the situation turned better. It peaked in 1965-66. <coughs> then he considered it's good opportunity for me to do something in own way to keep the control by himself, not a group of people in charge of in charge. all these things he wants to take them down. Same thing happened in 2012. He inherited the prosperity from his the prior policy, Deng Xiaoping and Zhou and and Hu Jintao kept growing to the extent in 2016, 17, 18, at peak, he won the third term and he had his own idea. But now you can see, you are starting to see the impact, his own person, the win voice, win decision, made to the negative thing on China. Then you can see, if that peaks, the trend peaks, they're going down, they will lose their strength. That's the game for US. <coughs> if he, his 
definitely has been attention to the third to the fourth term until his body cannot do that. So the longer he is in power, the worst situation will be happening in China. So then that goes for the US. That's what I feel the hope. I agree with you largely. I mean, that's uh, um, China in history has not been on China's side in the sense that China's major setbacks throughout history, I'm going back thousands of years, have been the Chinese shooting themselves in the foot. I mean, I, I'm afraid to name anything that wasn't invented in China first you know, paper money, printing presses, irrigation systems, they all seem to be invented in China first, and then they seem to travel through the trade routes to Westerners who implement it as innovation, right? So there's been a problem with the Chinese system for thousands of years. And, and I would ass assume it's based on certain negative aspects of Confucianism, and even perhaps of Buddhism and other philosophies way before communism. Now, you're right. The economic situation uh, is against China because their recent actions on their own domestic economy don't bode well for their future. But on the other hand, I think they know that. That's a good reason why they don't want to wait. That might be another reason why Xi Jinping would rather move now that when China's inflation and unemployment is much higher and their growth rate is much slower. And as that starts to wind down, nationalism, you know, the Americans are holding us back. Does it sound familiar? Because they're not allowing us to get technology that we need. And now you have to prepare yourself for very unusual, difficult events in the future, right? They're preparing their people for that. The Americans are not. So again, I think that time is on our side. And I think the window where time is on our side is from 2030 or 35 after that. Because the newer weapon systems that are in development now are gonna be online at that time. And they'll be superior in many ways to the Chinese weapon systems and the relative advantage that the Chinese have militarily now will be withered away much more. And they'll realize that. But that's all the more reason why they should do something now until that happens. The Americans know they screwed up big time already. They know that. They don't have the Patriot missiles. They don't have the cruise missiles. They don't have damn ammunition because of the way they've set things up here in their military supply chain. And the same with the Europeans. But they're working hard on that. So I have to feel if not finding a solution, they'll improve it greatly. Yes, I agree with you. I heard the, the Chinese general said you know, in the video, I heard, why US is behind? Because in the past 20 years, US focused on terrorists. Terrorists does not have advanced weapons. It's a very simple thing. US is enough. But China, from very early when they redeveloped, they targeted the US. So they, they developed high advanced weapons. So that's why the US. I can tell you another reason why the US is way behind. Because the technology and research they do is on renewables and green technology. And that general said because the U.S. focused on biology. He said they focus on biology because the pharmacy, pharmaceutical company can make a lot of money. Well, ask yourself a question. How can it be that the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians have hypersonic weaponry and we don't? How can they have gotten such a jump? on military technology over what's supposed to be the strongest country in the world. How is that even conceivable? Okay, let me tell you, this one, for particularly your question, this point, I know that. What the US people said is that we didn't do this on purpose because it's very expensive. It's not like the Chinese said, this is an 
defendable. Why? Because you are facing them face to face, not behind them. So they are saying we are six times of the, the sound speed. That don't matter. But would you say in our case it's a misallocation of the priorities? Yeah. What? Without a doubt. Look, when I was a kid and I was taught in school what this country was working on technologically, no one brought up green energy and, 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 and global warming and climate change. It's a lot of nonsense. If you had brought that up, you would have put the person in a padded room. And then you have a guy who makes billions in a movie and wins a prize and everyone goes to watch An Inconvenient Truth and we have a new national priority. If it weren't so sad, I'd be, I'd be laughing. Oh, I always depend on politicians to tell me what the scientific priority should be. And not only that, how it's all been determined and that part of science is you should never be skeptical or you'd be a skeptical person. And God knows science is based on what your political leaders tell you to believe and do and not what your brain might be capable of learning through proper education. And if your brain was learning, then you would never be an environmentalist. You'd be a conservationist. So all the stuff that I expected to see at this point in my life, virtually none of it is there. Could it have been there? 100%, 100%. But that was a hijacking of technology. That's a whole other session. But I wanna clarify one point I made so that I don't put you into a gloomy state completely. Um, I think that there is a window between now and 2035. Let's call it the next 10 years. If you manage to avoid a major war with China or similar types of engagements over the next 10 years, I think that we go into a different phase of analysis. But the next five years or even sooner, you should not kid yourself. It's a very, very gloomy and nerve wracking period right now. Uh, when I get up in the morning, I always check to make sure, you know, if I should be going to my, my shelter. No, I'm just kidding. I don't do that. But I, I, if, it, if, if it were to happen in the next two or three years, I would not be surprised. I would kind of expect it because that's when the window still remains open. Now, I'm not saying any Democrat is going to be a military dove and a pushover. I'm just saying Biden and his administration will be. That I know, because when I was much hairier on the head and much, much younger, I remember Biden from the Congress. He's been there forever. He was always an asshole. Everyone thought he was one of the dumbest individuals when I was in my 30s and 40s. No one said, you want to see a sharp congressperson? It's Joe. No one ever said that. He's just gotten a lot older. And as senile or not, I'm no doctor. He's just, let's say, as dumb as he's always been. And I apologize if you did vote for Biden and if you are on the committee to reelect, because I do wish you well, because that's the action and internecine pace of a democracy. Yes, sir. Okay, I, I need that boosted a little bit because my new hearing aids are not in yet. You're asking fine, but can I get it a little louder and, and refined? 